Hello listeners and welcome back to Sitcom Showdown. I'm Steve and I'm here with Jeff. Hello. Hi. Well, today I'm nominating something for the Hall of Fame and it's an episode of Parks and Recreation called Flu Season. Now this is the... I want to clarify this up front. It's the sickness kind of flu. This episode is not about that time of year in autumn where you get your chimney clean. Oh, well, there oh, you go. It took me about five minutes to write there that you. joke. Oh, nice one. Well, Flu Season is an episode that Entertain the Elk on YouTube described as the day Parks and Recreation was born. Uh, it's the point where everything started to come together for Parks and Rec, the cast, the characters and the writing, and it's also the fifth ranked Parks and Recreation episode on IMDb, which I think is pretty impressive considering that it ran for seven seasons and 125 episodes. So hmm. I did a bit of maths and that puts it in the top 4%, Jeff. Right. Um, I also think it'll be interesting to, to discuss if some of the comedy in this episode still hits the same after COVID-19. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that a bit yes. further on. When Tom's wearing his motorcycle helmet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my exactly, goodness. exactly. So, um, without further ado, mm-hmm. Parks and Recreation, also known as Parks and Rec, is an American political satire mockumentary sitcom television series, which IMDb describes as this the absurd antics of an indiana town's public officials as they pursue sundry projects to make pawnee that's the place a better place mm-hmm. now it was created by greg daniels and michael Scher, whose names are probably familiar to you jeff's nodding greg daniels co-wrote the classic seinfeld episode the parking space oh okay i didn't know that mm. and he headed up the u.s version of the office which we covered in sitcom showdown number five he also co-created Space Force with Steve Carell, which we covered in Sitcom Showdown 75. Yeah. Michael Scher, the other producer, he also worked on The Office. He created The Good Place, which we talked about in Sitcom Showdown 27 and 67. Mm-hmm. And he co-created Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Jeff, one of your favourites, Sitcom Showdown 39. So those guys have got a pretty good pedigree, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, if you looked through every sitcom we've ever done, there wouldn't be too many more... Sitcoms with better pedigrees. True. So this series aired on NBC from April the 9th, 2009 to February the 24th, 2015. And there was a special reunion episode which aired on April 30th, 2020, which was a fundraiser for a COVID-19 response fund. Right. Mm. Are you up on Parks and Rec, Jeff, or is this no. the first time you've seen it? Yeah, well, I have said on Sitcom Showdown previously, probably two or three times, um, that I've never seen Parks and Rec before. Oh, it's a blind spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally is. Uh, I had not seen it until you requested that I watched this episode. Oh, until I forced you to watch it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Well, we, we're getting hints of, you know, how it was when we did Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You yeah. mean you hated it? No, no, no. In Let's not get into any it. of that. That's fine. <laughs> Well, this one's one that gets put on and taken off Netflix in Australia regularly, so... <laughs> Particularly was... when you want to watch it, yeah. they'll take it off. <laughs> it as soon as I decide I want to do it, it for Sitcom Showdown, they take it off. <sighs> has it come back no. since? Okay. No. Anyway, I got up... I think I was deep into Series 4 when they took it off the last time, so... You know, something to look forward to in the future when mm. they bring it back. Or I can borrow it from the library. Yeah, of yeah. course. Brilliant. Hmm. Oh, well, let's talk a bit about the actors. Parks and Recreation is another sitcom with an ensemble cast, which makes this quite a painful. Yep, yep. Yeah, so the main cast numbers 10 people at this point in the show. So I'm going to attempt to race through this. Um, Amy Poehler is the main character, Leslie Nope, a perky mid-level, mid-level bureaucrat in the Parks Department. Amy studied improv at Second City. Mm-hmm. She joined Saturday Night Live and stayed for seven or eight years before leaving to join Parks and Recreation. Now, both of the producers we were talking about earlier also came out of Saturday Night Live, so I don't know uh, if there was a connection there of some sort. Anything to say on Amy before we move on? Uh, no, 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 no. All right. Rashida Jones plays Anne Perkins. Mm. Anne is a nurse who gets drawn into local government, which is what we call it here in Australia, okay. through her friendship with Leslie. And that happens in the first... Well, the friendship's established in the first season. And she actually works for the for the Shire or for the council or whatever you want to call it, city. What, as a medical? Later on. No. no okay. No, something else. Right. So Rashida has done lot, heaps of work, including a stint on The Office prior to this. I don't yes, know if you I remember her it. from that. Yep. Yep. Mm. Aziz Ansari, 
plays Tom Haverford, who is, I've got him here, as an underperformer in government and more of an entrepreneur. Does that sound about yeah, right from what you said? Going off this episode I've watched, yes. Hmm. So then why wouldn't you just go to the private sector and make some money? Well, it's a good point. Yes. So Aziz is the creator and star of the Netflix series Master of None, which has been running since 2015. Uh, for which he's won several acting and writing awards, including two Emmys and a Golden Globe. Oh. Well, I didn't know that before. Right, I okay. That. He must so. be likeable in those other shows. Yeah, <laughs> good, on, good on him. Nick Offerman is Ron Swanson, who is a, just a classic character in my books. Yep. He's the Parks and Recreation Director, who is a staunch li- also a staunch libertarian. So he believes in government being as small as possible. Mm-hmm. And... It says here, as such, Ron strives to make his department as ineffective as he can and favours hiring employees who do not care about their jobs or are poor at them. Now, we're going to see that in this episode we're about to talk about. And that is the only way it would explain April. Yes, I said April was an example. Talking about April, Aubrey Plaza plays April Ludgate and April starts out as an intern and works her way up to to being Ron's PA. Now, Aubrey, I don't know if you've ever... Looked her up on YouTube, but she's an absolute card. A unique, awkward individual. Mm-hmm. Have you seen her on any talk shows or anything like no, that? No, but I've got a rant about this later on. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll look forward to that. Yeah. Anyway, her career's gone from strength to strength, and she's moved into movies. Right. I think she's either she's in a big movie that's coming out now or just about to come out. Yeah, so and she's, she's doing going to be in um, the Agatha for Marvel show. Oh. You know, the, okay, the witchcrafty Marvel thing. Yeah, and they maybe they've change that from being a show into a movie and maybe that's what we're thinking of i'm all very vague on how things are going with marvel now Mm. you haven't checked out have you jeff no no i go and see all the ones you don't see that's how committed (laughs) i am that's right now talking about movie stars and marvel movies we've got chris pratt as andy dwyer Mm. a goofy dim-witted but lovable slacker and of course everyone knows who chris is at this point from guardians of the galaxy etc and he's done lots of other stuff apart from that as well uh, so it's kind of interesting to see him in Parks and Recreation because he starts off in this minor role as Anne's ex-boyfriend, but through his sheer comedic genius, works his way up into a bigger role and the main cast. So is is this a good time to mention that, you know, the, the word is that both with the American office and Parks and Rec, that mm. both of them were not great in their first seasons. And to you know, to the point where even fans go as far as to say, if, yeah, if you're new to the show, don't worry about season one. Mm. And so they used the feedback they got in the first seasons to try and improve the shows, and they went on to be big hits. And so you do wonder if leaning a little bit more on Chris Pratt might have been part of oh, that. Yeah, so they they got rid of the town planner, right? Don't know how Boom. I feel about that. Yeah. Mark Brandanowitz, um, and then brought in. Ben. So that was Sorry, part of it. Uh, and they elevated Adam and Rob. Yeah, yeah. Right. And elevated Chris's character as well. So they were making all sorts of Yeah. So we've got to be careful kind of when we're talking about Chris, because we could be talking about Chris Pratt, the actor, or Rob Lowe's character called Chris. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to get this straight in my head. Either way, but you're some doing a great job so far. Hunky, yeah. hunky dude. Well they're both handsome hunky dudes. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's easy to get confused. It is. <laughs> uh where did we get to? Okay, yeah, we've sorry, got... we're on Aubrey. Yes, I've moved on to, we've got Retta as Donna Meagle and Jim O'Hare as Jerry mm. Gugic. And then we're going to finish up with two characters we just mentioned, which were added at the end of season two as part of this shakeup. We've got Adam Scott as Ben Wyatt, a brilliant but socially awkward government official who's trying to redeem his past as a failed mayor in his youth. Oh. That's quite a funny, funny detail, which they come back to. They hark back to that quite often. So Adam is a well-known comedian, and he's had many different roles. Right before joining Parks and Recreation from 2009 to 2010, he appeared on the Stars Network in a show called Party Down. Mm -hmm. And that earned him an Entertainment Weekly UWI nomination for Best Actor in a Comedy Series in 2009. All right, hang on. An UWI. An UWI. E-W-W-Y. Well, I like it. How do you pronounce it? Yeah. It's it's attention-getting. Hmm. Another role that I'm interested in uh, of his is when he co-starred with Craig Robinson in the sitcom Ghosted. He's great in everything. Ah, there you go. So I think the two of them could be quite good, but anyway. Yeah, Yeah, also famously of The Office as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Then last but not 
how could he be least? Mm. Rob Lowe as Chris Traeger. Mm-hmm. We could spend a whole hour discussing Rob. As a young man in the 80s, he shot to movie stardom as part of the Brat Pack. He moved into TV in the late 90s as Sam Seaborn on The West Wing, which is where I know him from the best. And I think that also established his comedy chops because there's lots of funny mm. lines and you know quick right, funny banter and stuff like that in The West Wing. Um, but anyway, after The West Wing, he had another bit of a gap and then he came across to Parks and Recreation. So oh. he's you know had steady work over the years and gone mm. through a number of phases transitions or phases as actors mm. tend to do yeah anyway he's pretty pretty interesting and he's been around for a long Decades. long time working so that's mm. that's all good um before we get started on the synopsis a bit of background so that things make better sense for the listeners and for you jeff uh-huh. perhaps at the end of season 2 anne lost the plot after breaking up with mark brandenowitz and as a result she kissed andy in one of the previous episodes who at that time had become interested in April and mm. vice versa. Um, so that's why April's got it in for her when we come to this episode. Aha. Uh-huh. So mm. context is important. It is. Mm. So have mm. you watched all, you know, you watch season one, season two, yep. season three, right, right cool. Because obviously I've never watched Parks and Rec. Mm. And I thought, okay, before I sit down and actually watch the thing, what I should do is note down all my impressions of the show and why I mm. haven't watched it and all this sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's an interesting experiment. All right. Have you uh, got something there then? Have I got something here? Well, uh, um, anyway, yes. Uh, so when we did Brooklyn Nine-Nine, it just hit all my triggers of stuff I don't like about sitcoms. And then I, I can't remember if I actually ended up saying, yeah, let's put it in the Hall of Famer, if I went bananas on it <laughs> and went off on one of my typical things. And oh, then th- three weeks later, I said, Steve, this is a brilliant show. And I now have the box set and I've watched it several million times. I recall this. It was a yeah. Halloween episode and... The Halloween theme for Brooklyn Nine-Nine oh, is yes. that they have a challenge between Captain Holt and Jake. Yeah, yeah. It's some kind of a, you know, they have to steal something or, you know, something like that. Anyway, I got talked you into it because it was like a, it's not a magic kind of thing, but it's a, you know, reveal of how this happened and then that happened and they were tricking each other yeah. and all this sort oh, of stuff. Oh, and I might have said it was very much like uh, in that show Leverage, at the end of the episode, they show you how they pulled off the mm. heist. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, before you do that, mm. the fact that we both work in local government yeah. makes me, well, for me anyway, it makes me more interested to watch a sitcom about local government. It's a bit like Utopia, because that's also in a similar kind of line mm. of work to what I do. So, yeah. uh, Are you about to tell us? Yes, well, anyway, what I did why is you didn't uh, like I, it? I did a little bit of research, Steve. And uh, Michael Scher, I mean, obviously I like The Office, I like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I like The Good Place, um, Greg Daniels. And uh, I was interested to find out he was the Friday Night Dinner USA version person. Oh, yeah, I did see that. I didn't mention it. Uh, there you go. So yeah, what You I... didn't look up whether that pilot, which didn't get picked up, is on YouTube. No. Nah. Mm. So anyway, this isn't like... Uh, it's not like a point of pride or anything. And I say, well, everyone <laughs> loves this show, which they do. So I'm not going to watch it because I'm a contrarian okay. and blah, 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 blah. Glad I we think... established that. Thank you, yeah. Oh, there's probably 10% of that, let's face it. But... There's an element of, I think at the time I was thinking, you know, I really don't need a cut price bargain basement version of The Office, you know, and that's what I thought this was. And so then when I did a bit of research, would you believe I just went, oh my goodness, it actually is. And it turns out they were trying to create a spin off of The Office, mm. realized they weren't going to spin off anything very successfully. So they thought they'd create a show from scratch that's just like a spin-off of The Office, and that's what this is. Because it's a mockumentary with exactly the same yeah, style, well, that's is that the what thing. you mean? So, no, no, this is like they said, we need a spin-off of The Office, and then after trying to work on it, they said, okay, let's abandon that idea and just create new characters and do da-da-da-da-da. But I thought that was my feeling, and it's turned yep. out to be true. Anyway, uh, and here's another of my impressions, is that a few years ago, Ron Swanson memes were everywhere. Mm. And so then eventually I learned that this bloke looking grumpy he's from parks and rec but like my impression of this show was oh god it's going to be full of sarcastic beautiful people who treat each other like crap Ah. and then the other half of the characters are going to be wacky for the sake of wacky and it's going to be all writers who think they're geniuses and people who have done you know 30 takes of every scene because they're all improv people that's interesting and they're all hailed as genius legends even though 25 of their 30 takes were cold garbage and it's exactly the sort of stuff you know this is what's going through in my mind mm. anyway <clears> but <throat> results in good stuff like the other side of that equation of course is who cares how many takes 
someone gets if the mm. end result is genius and it makes you laugh out oh. loud. Um, but again, oh. like this is, you know, uh, this is before I've watched the show, right? Yep. Bear in mind. So I know I'm angering, angering a lot of our listeners here. And again, we've had our Brooklyn Nine-Nine conversation rather where, uh, you know, I turned out to be dead wrong and it was a fantastic show and stuff. Now, I've actually since watched the show and we'll see how it all mm. turned out. All right. But maybe there's other people like me out there who haven't watched Parks and Rec and these are some of the thoughts they have. Yep. Leaving? I thought we had a meeting. No, we do. It's just I think it's a little chilly in here. Are you okay? Your eyes are glassy. Oh my god. Oh my. Is she, is she sick? Are you sick? No. Yeah, she's sick. That's why I'm wearing this and misting myself with hand sanitizer. I'm not sick. I just have allergies, okay? I took a Claritin and I threw that up. So I took another one, I threw that up, and then I took a third and it stayed down. I'm getting better. All right, you're burning up. You're burning up. What? I have to get out of here. I have 2.8% body fat. My body's like a microchip. A grain of sand could destroy it. My body's a microchip. Leslie, go home. No, I can't. I can't go home. I have to get ready for the Chamber of Secrets. Commerce. If this meeting does not go perfectly, then the Harvest Festival is going to be over before it began. I cannot go home. Okay, then who's your doctor? Anne's my doctor. And she's the most beautiful nurse in the world. So just as we start the synopsis, I'll remind everyone that we're trying to discuss the gags in the synopsis rather than at the end. Um, so, Jeff, as we make our way through, if you think of something that I haven't mentioned. Yep, jump in. So we open the episode in Pawnee St. Joseph Hospital with Anne speaking to the camera, and she's explaining that there's a crazy flu going around. I want to pause here because there's this American thing where they talk about the stomach flu, which is what we, I think what is what we would call gastro. Well, is that what we're talking about? Because they're not... Well, it's more fun if we assume that. <laughs> a flu for us in Australia is, uh, you know, a really bad cough, mucus. Extremely high temperature. Like a really bad dizziness, cold. Dizziness, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas um, the symptoms that these characters have got are more, you know, they're vomiting and diarrhea and all this sort of stuff, yep. as well as temperatures, so... Gastroenteritis. We might be talking about the stomach flu. I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway. Well, I reckon we're to already off to a great start by assuming that, so that'll be cool. Oh, good. It's more more entertaining that way, is it? Yeah. Hmm. Anywho, April has succumbed to this flu, and having been admitted to the hospital, she's giving Anne a really hard time at her workplace, because as we've said before, Anne is a nurse. And Anne had been snogging Andy. <gasps> yes, that's why she's giving her such a hard, giving Anne such a hard time. It's because she'd snogged Andy previously. Scandal. Um, but let's face it, as we've already said, April hasn't got the sunniest disposition at the best of times. And like most of us, you get a bit cranky when you're sick. So it's just making it worse. Yeah. And look, uh, uh, this is a criticism, but not a heavy one. It's mm. just that when you, and we'll get to this later, when you look at Rob Lowe, he looks sick as... Like the red eyes, the mm. dark circles, he's sweating his head off. And I think the when you got... You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, and to a lesser extent with Leslie, you get a bit of that, mm. but she still looks quite well put together. And April doesn't look sick at all. So she just sniffs a little bit. Do you know what I mean? And I'm yep. thinking are there different levels of this because he needed to be hospitalized. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure April needed to be hospitalized. She looked quite normal. Mm. Uh, anyway, Good point, is there yeah. a plot reason Good for point. this? I don't know. I'm just being nitpicky because I went into it at this early stage wanting to nitpick. So Nothing right. comes to mind. No. Oh, good. Then we're going to have the intro, and then we come back from the intro with Leslie having a meeting at JJ's diner with JJ, and she's wants to talk to him about participating in the upcoming Harvest Festival. This is a very important mm -hmm. thing in this episode. And it's obvious that she's not feeling well either because... <laughs> She says she's already vomited like five times today, which I think is testament to her insane work ethic. Yeah. Uh, that she's still going despite all that, because I would have packed it in as soon as my stomach started feeling a bit wrong. 100%, which is something that local government lets you do. Yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, you're right. As far right. as Leslie's concerned, yeah. the Harvest Festival waits for no man. So it's... 
Yeah, but you know, like we suffer from man flu, whereas Leslie's a powerhouse. She is. She would just soldier on with Codrell. She's a legend. Anyway, she's inviting. Oh, I forgot to mention that Ben's with her in this meeting. And she's inviting JJ, that's the owner of the diner, to a meeting tonight where the details about the festival will be shared in full. And he seems receptive to this, as she is his favourite customer, really. <laughs> he says last year she spent over $1,000 on waffles alone. Yeah. That's a, a lot of waffles. That is a lot of waffles, because you have to Im- imagine in the Midwest, waffles would be cheap as buggery. You know, it'd be like three bucks. And yeah. so, you well, know. You can imagine she's basically having breakfast with someone three or four she's four trying times to a talk week. to um, yeah. every morning. Well, quite. What better way to start the day and put someone in a good mood and if you want something from them? Good mockumentary stuff because, of course, you know, at that point we get Leslie looks to camera and sort of very subtly shakes her head as if to say, no, there's no way I'd spend $1,000 on waffles. There's no way I ate $1,000 worth of waffles last year. It was very, very subtle, very good. Mm. Back at the hospital, which I called (laughs) PSJH. Ron, a PB and J. Yeah. That's one for the American listeners. Ron has stepped out of his comfort zone and he's gone to visit April. He gives her a gift of some woman stuff, which hits the mark better than the gift that she got from her parents. And Aubrey is superb as April. Looking at Ron, she flicks her finger disdainfully at the teddy bear in the corner, which her parents sent her. Yeah, about five foot of teddy bear. A massive, massive oh, yeah. teddy bear. Yeah, but she seems to be appreciative of the... What was it? Magazines Mag- and lipstick. Yeah, so he did all right. These two have a very yeah. sweet relationship. Um, both of them find it hard to extend or maintain social niceties in, in their own way. So they get seem to get along well together. And Ron says um, he's not very good at visiting people in hospitals. So that's just one example of that. Mm. I don't think she would be either. Yeah, and he just goes, so I'm going to go. He says, <laughs> I'm he off. Leave, yeah. um, but before he leaves, she asks Ron not to tell Andy where she is. And I'm not exactly sure what. Uh, her motivation is for doing that because he cuts her off and says, it's my policy not to... I don't want to know why. Yeah, don't tell me any personal information or anything like that. The less I know, the better. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, for whatever reason, she asks him not to say. Leslie has gone following this Hang breakfast. On, I'm just well, going to stop you right up, there, Steve, because there's straight after that, you cut to a brilliant bit of Ron outside the, the hospital room where they're interviewing him in the hallway typical what i assume is typical ron he goes oh i never want to know anything about what my co-workers do because i'm not interested in caring for people i once worked with a guy for three years never learned his name <laughs> uh, it was the best work friendship i ever had and he just says we still never talk sometimes <laughs> <laughs> and we still never talk sometimes is just a brilliant line yep yeah, so it's right up there with the line from best in show where this woman says about her husband, oh, we could talk or not talk for hours. Yeah. <laughs> the we joke being that he's like an octogenarian that's pretty much sitting in the corner by himself. Um, oh, not very animated. Now, you mentioned the relationship between April and uh, Ron. Which you don't care about. Yeah, which I don't care about. Um, the, And I don't want to drag this thing out to a two-hour podcast or anything, but where do you, you know, do you see any similarities or, or differences between the Captain Holt Gina relationship and the Ron and April relationship. Cause I, I get the feeling Captain Holt kind of needs Gina there to keep idiots out of his office. And but she is a thoroughly unlikable, nasty piece of work. But um she's a genius at her job mm. and that's what Captain Holt wants her there to do. I think the key difference is the is that the idiots Holt wants kept out of his office actually work for him, whereas Ron <laughs> Wants the general public kept out of his office. Oh. Well, and probably the staff as well. Right. Yes. How can the general that, public just walk in it. there? I do. I watched a highlight reel, mm. and um, Ron, for some reason, had this circular desk. <laughs> <laughs> and he can, did you see the same one? Yeah, do you know was, what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope the listener has seen this as well. So this customer is trying to talk to him. And because his desk is a circle, he can just roll around on his chair. To turn his back. To, to turn him. his back on her the whole time. She's chasing him around. You it was so will, good. This will be a new CEO oh. comes in and says, this is a brilliant. Everyone's got to have one of these circular workstations. Oh, oh, I've gone right yeah. off track. It was good. Um, so Leslie, following this meeting at JJ's for breakfast with waffles, she's gone to the office to the horror 
of her colleagues, Tom, Donna and Jerry, who are begging her to go home. And in the meantime, they've locked themselves up in a conference room. And she retaliates um, to this by germing up all of Jerry's stuff. That's what she's doing. She's like spitting on a hand and then rubbing it over yeah, his She licks mo- his mug. monitor. Yeah. Licked his mug. Ugh. All that good um, stuff. Yeah, that's on my best gags list, so I can cross that one off. Oh, yeah, well it was done. good. I think I think now, seeing as you did want to talk about COVID, yeah. you would be sacked for that instantly. Yeah, I don't think it was proportional. No, no. Response. But I'm just saying that during the heights of COVID, if you were oh. actually allowed to go to work, oh yeah, you probably and you and you were licking someone's mug in front of everybody while being knowingly sick. I don't even want to think about what happened. Would have happened to you. Back at the hospital, Chris has dropped by as part of his daily run. Now, I've got a question here. What's he doing with his shoe at the start of this scene? He's holding his... He's sitting. don't know what he's sitting on, but anyway, he's got his foot right up in front of himself. He's got his running shoe, and he seems to be sniffing at it or looking at it or something like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nope. No. Okay. Do you want to have a quick peek at it now? Sure. Oh. Um, right. Having right. reviewed the... <laughs> the footage. The footage... I believe that's him trying to touch his toes to his forehead in a flexibility move. So it's a very sort of um, stretch class sort of oh. deal. All right. Chris isn't wasting a minute. Yeah. I mean, if you tried to do that, in fact, let's do that now, Steve. No, I am no, not. Okay. There's no I way refuse. that either of us would be able to get our foot anywhere near our forehead. So Rob Lowe is a human oh. pretzel. Rob's just... <laughs> and he's got to be 10 years older than us if he's a day. So good on him. Enough showing off, Rob. Yeah. All right, so we got that out of the way. Yeah, what did anyway, you think it was, Steve? He might have trodden in some muck and he was have... giving his shoe a whiff to find out I don't if know. he. Um... I haven't. This is why I'm asking the question. I've uh, okay. literally got no idea. Anyway, <laughs> the last mile of his run before reaching the hospital was his slowest ever at five and a half minutes. And he's come to say hello to Anne to confirm that their date for tomorrow night is still on. And he's wearing an N. Well, I don't know. I'm assuming it's an N95 mask because his body, quote, He's finely tuned like a microchip, and the flu is like a grain of sand. It can literally shut down the whole system. Mm. I love that line. So I assume that the joke, or it is a joke, or there is a joke here, that this super fit, super healthy person who can touch their foot to their forehead yeah. is masking up to guard against getting sick. Mm-hmm. Basically being a hypochondriac, is that? Am I assuming yeah, that's I right? Yeah, I reckon so. Yep. All right. So the, my question is, how does this play now, post-COVID-19 um, versus mm-hmm. when it was made? At that time, you would have gone, bloody hell, he's taken it a bit far, isn't he? What a paranoid Percy. Yeah. He's just come in wearing a mask. You would have thought he was a complete you know, weenie tune. But now, we just be going, that's completely normal. You know <laughs> exactly. what I mean? We just get, you know, I'll walk down the mall and people are still wearing masks and all that sort of stuff. And I, I think nothing of it. I did it's see just some, another bit of clothing. I did see someone wearing a mask on a... 35 degree day at the beach a couple of weeks ago and I, right. I did a double take at that but you're right mm. for everyday use yeah but she is off put by Chris's apparent perfection <laughs> yes <laughs> which she's finding it hard to find any flaws we will return dude. to that mm. a bit later on back at the office Ron is lamenting having to find a temporary replacement for April no one will have the whole package that she does that perfect combination of apathy and aggression <laughs> I think it's funny how he has to tempor- temporarily replace someone who is theoretically ineffective at their job. Yeah. Because the one thing April does do for him is to shield him from the public, which is, yes, answering your question from before. Um, and so, Ron, considering his requirements, he's inspired to go and see what Andy is doing. Right. And he visits Andy's shoe shine stand. Now, you haven't seen Andy's... You hadn't seen it before this episode. No. I just find it hilarious that they have a shoe shine stand mm-hmm. in the local government office. Like, what's that about? Yeah, I don't know. It's probably a tradition going back 150 years. It could be. There's always been a shoe shine there. It might be like a cat on a boat or a ship or something like that. You've got to have a. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for good luck. In every local yeah. government building in uh, certain states, you'd have to have a shoe shine boy. Yes, and to keep away the rats. Ah, yeah. oh, yeah. well, possibly so. Anyway, um,. We see Andy, and he's stoked because he's invented something called Super Straw. <laughs> he's essentially joined a dozen or so straws, mm-hmm. and he's using it to drink out of a container on the floor while he sits up high on the shoe sh- shoe shine seat mm-hmm. with a look on his face that is absolutely priceless. Oh, he's a child, essentially. I've got 
it's sheer childish joy yeah. on his face. Uh, nevertheless, he does agree to leave the super straw and fill in for April, just so long as he doesn't have to tuck his shirt in. And he does eventually realise that April's not there, hence <laughs> the reason for him being there. Yeah. And he asks Ron if she's okay, and Ron lies to cover for her as requested, saying that he gave her the day off. And Andy immediately says, would it be weird if I asked for the day off? <laughs> and Ron just looks at him. Yeah, so come on, dude. Yeah. What are you doing here if you, you think you're going to have the yeah. day off as well? <sighs> Still in the office, Ben appears for the first time. He's come to fetch Leslie for a meeting, which is presumably some prep for tonight's Chamber of Commerce meeting about the Harvest Festival. And he notices that she's quite rugged up as if she's about to leave the office. But she claims it's chilly in the office, and that's why she's dressed up like like she's... Chris, who's unmasked now, comes in and he immediately grabs Ben by the arm and hides behind him and asks if Leslie is sick. It's like he can sniff out... Sickness. Sickness or something like that. Yeah. So first she claims that she's got allergies, and then she says she's getting better because she didn't throw up her third lot of Claritin. (laughs) She kept the third lot down, so she's getting better. Oh. Anyway, Chris immediately leaves, saying, I have 2.8% body fat. My body's like a microchip. A grain of sand could destroy it. My body's a microchip. (laughs) And he's just, he looks very worried. He is very worried, but Ben is made of sterner stuff. Yes, he's being very nice. Yes, he bundles Leslie out of the door. Yeah. Despite her objection about having to get ready for what she's now calling the Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. (laughs) Which I'm assuming is a Harry Potter thing. Yeah, it totally is. That's on my great gags list. Oh. Not Chamber of Commerce. Oh, no. No, no. Chamber of Secrets. Oh. Um, but anyway, she does remind him how important tonight's meeting is. And on the way out, they pass Andy, who has typed, apparently typed Leslie's symptoms into Google. Oh, my God. Now I'm hot. Now it's really hot in Okay, here. well, that's your fever. Leslie, I, I typed your symptoms into the thing up here, and it says you could have network connectivity problems. <laughs> Yep, absolutely, Steve. Yes. That's gold. Now, coming back to the comments so you made the, earlier about Chris improv. Pratt, yeah, doing 30 takes to come up with that, and the other 29 were complete rubbish and wasted everybody's time for an hour. Who cares? Because he came up with that. So well, Yeah, before I get to my actual point. Yes. He, he drops this improv line as they're making their way. Like, they're in shot while he's doing it. Mm. So if it bombed they would have had to have come back into the room and come, gone out. And reshoot. The reshoot, the whole thing. So anyway. was it a scripted line? It I was, don't know. No, it was improv. You're absolutely right. It was well, improv. Uh, did you uh, listen to the commentary or something? Uh, well, there's articles about it. Oh. And there's compilation clips of the best improv lines. Oh, cool. From Parks and Rec. But this improv line was considered by the producers to be one of the best lines ever in the show. Yeah. And they were quite disgusted because, you know, they'd been putting hours of effort into writing the show and he just drops this uh, nugget of gold. Yeah. And despite my massive rant earlier, which I stand by, it's um that is easily the best gag in the whole episode. It's, it's brilliant. There you go. So, you know. Moving on. Moving on. Ben takes Leslie to the hospital to see her doctor, Anne. I don't know why she's claiming Anne is her doctor. But because well, she as loves this, Anne. Well, yeah, I reckon it's 90% that. And yes, she meant it sincerely and she wasn't hallucinating. But as we got from that Chamber of Secrets line, we're starting to move from Leslie feeling bad into, you know, she gets to full-blown hallucination stage. Oh, yeah, we're but, you know, we're at the very beginning of that where she's mixing up her words and uh, she doesn't know yep. she's mixing up her words. That's right. Um, Anne does confirm that Leslie has a high temperature and other symptoms and she admits her to hospital and she's essentially bedridden. Mm. So what's going to happen with this meeting? I don't know. Um, But Ben, taking his assumed responsibility of taking over for the meeting stuff, um, he he tries and fails to have a prep meeting with Tom instead. Mm. Andy, taking his assumed responsibility seriously, nevertheless attempts and fails to put another call through to Ron. (laughs) He says, oh, I've dropped another call, Ron. Ron just gives him the thumbs up. (laughs) That's exactly what I hired Andy for. Yeah, that's right. You're doing, you're doing amazing. Up, yeah. Keep it up. And mm. April continues her campaign of reta- retaliation against Anne from her hospital bed, which is a bit like biting the hand that feeds you, right? It's a bit. She's essentially in hospital, being waited on hand and foot, but giving Anne a hard time about it. Mm. It's a bit rough. At lunchtime, 
Ron and Andy have a conversation about food options, and I think that's another good time to insert a clip. I am starving. I haven't had lunch since yesterday, so I'm going to head over to Callahan's. Oh, no, 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 don't go there. They totally skimp on pickles. Let me go to Big Head Joe's for you. They have the most insane burritos. I don't much go for ethnic food. No, 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 trust me. They have one that's called the Meat Tornado. Literally killed a guy last year. You had me at Meat Tornado. Meat Tornado. Meat, meat Tornado is on my tornado. list of great gags. <laughs> And like Andy, I don't know if that was improv as well by Chris Pratt. He's turning me around, Christmas Pratt. Uh, Christmas Pratt. <laughs> that's him. The gift of Chris that Pratt. Dude. Yeah, that's his full name. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, well done, Steve. That was well improv. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes. It literally killed a guy last year. The meat tornado. <laughs> and Ron goes. Whoa. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh. So they're just um, getting on like house on fire. These two guys. Oh uh, yeah. Now we've skipped over another fantastic oh, gag, right. Steve. Um, Carry on. So Leslie's in the hospital and Anne is saying, listen, you know, I'm admitting you because this is officially getting really bad. Your fever's really bad. You're dehydrated as heck. Yeah. And so Leslie just said, look, if I was sick, could I do this? And they're all waiting for her to do something. <laughs> and finally says, what? And she goes, cartwheels. Aren't I doing them? <laughs> that's straight out of The Simpsons, I think, that line. That's, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Yeah. There you go. What did you think of that line? Did you think it was trailed uh, in air? Or, I didn't um... even mention it in my notes. So. Oh, okay. Leslie is nevertheless trying to escape the hospital while Chris has been admitted to the hospital. And when Anne confirms that he's got the flu, he looks aghast because the microchip has been compromised. Mm. <laughs> he takes it very seriously. Oh. Um, now we know while the last mile of the daily run was his personal worst. So I'll, I think that's great foreshadowing in the script there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, talking about exercise, Ron and Andy, post-lunch now, have decided to burn off some carbs from the meat tornado, playing some gridiron in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for another clip. This was delicious. It's awesome, huh? It's a whole new meat delivery system. Thank you, son. What do you say we go out to the parking lot and run a few pass plays to burn off the calories? You are an unstoppable good idea machine! <laughs> I like Andy. I'm surrounded by a lot of women in this department. And that includes the men. <sighs> that was on my great gags list. Well, should we mention it then? Well, I we think mention... we just did. Yes, anywho, we're, we're ticking off Jeff's um, favourite great gag list as we, gag go. List as we yeah. go here. Well, yeah, there we go. Ben is now in the foyer, greeting people as they arrive for the Chamber of Commerce meeting. Leslie, having stolen April's medicine and escaped the hospital, arrives dazed and confused. She's not there because she doesn't trust Ben. It's just that this project is her baby, but it's still clear that she's not up to the task and will probably do more harm than good. Um, because she's saying incredibly weird stuff. Well, like cut, you know, the cartwheel thing. Yeah. And the and the floor and the wall have switched, and she yeah. can't get her balance right. And she's really struggling. And he, I think Ben's concerned, right? That mm. if she gets up in front of three hundred people, she's just going to embarrass herself, yep. and it's going to do nothing to advance the project that they're working on. Because he does say to her, you know, I'm a little bit cheesed that you don't trust mm. me to do this. But I think, as you point out, it's it, that's only a little bit of it. Uh, he really is worried that she's going to do damage to her reputation, and it could jeopardise her big project. And rah rah rah. Mm. Mm. It's um, all getting very, you know, uh, uh, serious at this yes. point in the episode and emotional and lovely. The stakes are ramping up. Uh, having said that, though, Ron is standing at a barbecue <laughs> in his office. Yeah, drinking, drinking a scotch. Drinking or scotch. Lecturing Andy about the virtues of libertin libertarianism and the pitfalls of communism. Yeah. He describes communism as a big swing and a miss. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And Andy says... And what's that word for when a few clerics are in charge? Oh, religious oligarchy. Yeah. Like, like, where did he pull that one from? Oh, well, because Ron's been instructing him in the ways of religious oligarchy. Yes. Through that whole scene, all I could think of, isn't this setting off the smoke detectors? He's probably isn't disabled those ages ago. Detectors? Exactly. Yeah. Small okay, Ron. government control. Yeah. Well, that explains it perfectly. Wasting taxpayers' dollars on yeah. preventing fires. Hmm. Now, Steve, I'm going to rewind for another great right, gag. Okay. Go ahead. So, in the hospital, um, because you rightly point out that Leslie had stolen, like, April's mm. flu medicine. 
But Leslie, when Anne has her back turned at the hospital, has gone into a few people's rooms and stolen their stuff. And so uh, after April dobs Leslie in inadvertently by saying she came in here and stole my flu Mm. medicine, which is why I haven't taken any. Anne's running around the hospital and she runs into Rob Lowe's room, into Chris's room. Yep. And says, have you seen Leslie? And he goes, oh, I had a dream where she came in here and she took my flu medicine <laughs> and escaped through that hole in the wall. And then just turns around, she's looking around the room. She goes, what, you mean the door? <laughs> and that's how, like, Rob Lowe's acting in that is so good. Hmm. So that was a great line, delivered really well. Very good. Yeah, so I'm moving back to to Chris in the hospital and the microchip is in really bad shape. <laughs> I vomited somewhere in this room. I don't remember where, though. Wait, you might want to check that drawer. Stop pooping. Yeah, so that uh. stop pooping line is quite iconic. It's He's delivering it. I know the listeners can't, can't see this, but he's delivering it to himself in the mirror so intensely. <laughs> it's just feel like very funny as he's trying to re-establish control of his bodily functions through sheer force, force of will. Of will. <laughs> uh. And, um, yeah, Anne, seeing Chris in this state, is starting to lose some sense of awe that she had for him before. Yeah. Well, I think she's losing her sense of awe, but she's gaining something else, an appreciation of him, you know, as a human being. Tom has arrived just in time for the Chamber of Commerce meeting to kick off, and he's brought his three spa buddies who he'd been schmoozing with for most of the day. And these guys apparently own car dealerships and are now willing to donate to the Harvest Festival, which I suppose is a good outcome, but Tom's methods are questionable, I think it's fair to say. But he gets results. He gets results. It's outreach to the community. So. Oh, yes, all right. You're selling it to me now. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> anyway, I'm saying that... The... I'm sure there's a way you could tax deduct it as well. <laughs> Probably. So the episode's kind of cooking right now. It's... um. Yes, the stakes are going up and all that sort of stuff. Things are winding up in the day for the day in the office, and Andy asks Ron about April again, and he says, "You know, I'm upset because she's avoiding me, and it's making me miserable." And Ron, who's can obviously hear the sincerity in Andy's voice, and knowing that he's a good guy, overturns this commitment that he's got to not interfering with people's personal lives. And tells Andy how she's actually in hospital with the flu. And, you know, go along and see her tomorrow morning. And I think, Jeff, that he's kind of giving Andy permission to skip work and do that Mm. instead. That's kind of implied, isn't it? Yep. What a guy. Back at the meeting, Ben is very concerned when Leslie gets up to open proceedings. But she actually manages to pull it off flawlessly. You would never know that she's hallucinating (laughs) while she's doing this. And we get a couple of very nice looks of shock and admiration direct to the camera from Ben. Did yeah. you like that? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's and good. what they've done there is, uh, you know, like how I constantly bring up that quote about comedy being the subverting of expectations. And it would have been great if Leslie got up there and done all this weird stuff and shocked everybody. But they have subverted the expectation and have her deliver, deliver it flawlessly. And that's... Mm. Also some good laughs, but they get their cake and eat it too. Yes, as we're about to hear and see. Yeah, 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 with a brilliant line that I hope you bring up, and if you don't, then I shall. Yes, very good. At the hospital, Anne's shift is now over, and she really lets April have it, Mm. releasing the whole day's worth of frustration. Then apologises for kissing Andy uh, in what she says was a moment of confusion and reiterates that it's not his fault at all. Uh, and she says, she's getting towards the end of this tirade, she says, she's now starting to hate April herself. And she storms out. Yeah. But rather than being put off, April admits to the camera, that's the most I've ever liked Anne. <laughs> uh, uh. Yes, because she likes to see the worst in people. Leslie has successfully finished her speech, and it's gone down very well. She's getting a rousing round of applause. And it's gone down especially well with Ben who takes over um, while they're getting ready to take questions from the floor, and he takes over from Leslie because she's starting to lose the plot. Is this around the time when... Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Ben has to step in and say, you know, you can redirect your questions to me. And uh, Leslie's got another meeting. And <laughs> Leslie says, uh, give it up, everybody, for Scott Bakula from Quantum Leap, <laughs> <laughs> which is out of nowhere. And I just thought it was fantastic. It's very yeah. good. And Tom takes her off to the hospital. Where she can steal uh, more people's medicine. Yeah. Uh, but I think everything's worked out well for everybody as far as the Harvest Festival goes. Yes. So next, uh, the next day, back at the hospital, Ben has brought Leslie waffles, courtesy of JJ's Diner, and his own homemade chicken soup, which is a family recipe. She accepts the waffles, kind of turns her nose up at the chicken soup. Apparently, they needed 80 total businesses to participate, and they have 110 and counting. Mm. So it was. You're right, Jeff. It was a rousing success. Well done, team. Mm. And he congratulates her, and it's clear that his admiration might be turning to something else. Because I did read that, yes, they do get it on in um, later. <gasps> oh, did I spoil that for you, Steve? No, I knew that. How oh, good. Yep. I'm yeah. into that section of the show. Speaking of lovey-dovey stuff, Andy's also visiting the hospital next door, presumably. Although April appears to be asleep... He's apologising to her in his bumbling, charming kind of way. And as he leaves, we see her open her eyes and smile. So it seems that the relationship might be back on track. Mm. Lastly, also in the hospital, the microchip has bounced back. Chris is getting ready to go for a 15k run as hang he on, missed hang yesterday. On, hang on a moment. Yes, right. Sorry, whoa, whoa, Steve. Whoa, whoa, I didn't okay. mean to hassle you there. Um, did he say 15k? He specifically says 15k. Oh, all right. Because he well missed done. yesterday. So, well done on using metric. Yeah, I'm not sure why we've gone from miles to mm. to Ks, but anyway. Excellent. Yeah, get the impression that he's actually added some distance because he missed yesterday. Anyway, he's, he's fighting fit now. And he's telling Ben, who has come across from Leslie's room, that he's been given a new assignment from the boys upstairs. But he's thinking that perhaps they should ask to stay on in Pawnee for a bit longer, which Ben agrees would be a great idea. And that's pretty much the end of the episode. Is that because... Chris has got a love interest and he doesn't want to have to go well, off to another town or something. He's, well, he's got his date with Anne, so yeah, presumably no, that's he's what I mean. yeah, yeah. interested in her. But I think, and Ben's got his own interest in Leslie, but I think they're also warming up to the the town and the folks and all that sort of stuff as well. Ah. And enjoying the work, so, yeah. So they came into the show uh, as a tension-building thing where they were you know, going to be cutting costs and all this sort of stuff. So they've kind of come the full circle now. Oh, they've gone board. native, as they I've used got, to say. Yeah, mm. like Apocalypse Now. Without Not that the, there's much in common between Kurtz and yeah, Chris. Without slaughtering of cows and <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, uh, so where do you want to go from here? I've just got some concluding thoughts and you've got... I've got a page You've probably got more than me. Yeah, oh, but it is spaced out and it is in, you <laughs> know, 12 spaced. or 13. So it's, uh, you know... It's not as much Times as you think, Steve. Or... Times New Roman all the way. Oh, quality. Yeah, not because that's my preference, but it was there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Carry you on. want me to go? All right. Yeah, so these are very disorganized thoughts, steve Anyway, so I've got a headline here, and it says Ben, um, or rather a heading rather than a headline. Mm. Anyway, I said he was a, a scumbag demon in the good place, which he was. Oh, yes, he was. Yeah. And he was extremely unlikable in that, which means he must be doing a good job. And so that he'd be like that in every show. Mm. Uh, but he's not. He's just the opposite of that he in his show. Soup completely opposite. Way. From a homemade recipe. Ah, he did too. Um, he's great in this episode as a sort of anchor of normality. Mm. Mm. Um, so Adam Scott, man, he's um, he remembers to look at the camera at the right moments mm. with the suitable expressions. You know, he does a good job. Mm. We get... Um, bugger all of Jerry and Donna mm. in this episode. So my question for you is, you know, do they get a decent amount of lines in other episodes? Or are they all always sort of in the background, like in Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah, so they're the... have got our two, two old blokes who... Two older guys. They're the equivalent of those guys. <laughs> okay, right. In Parks and Rec. Uh-huh. All right, that makes it... They're yeah. the... I was thinking of Creed from The Office. So there's uh, a, well, even Creed, The Office yeah. has got, like, a handful of people that sit in the back and occasionally have a line and appear but that's true yeah so it's a similar kind of deal anyway yeah i thought this was a pretty good episode with great lines and the cast are good what they've done is they've masterfully had their cake and eaten it too because you and me like to talk a lot about when we pick an episode of a sitcom 
it could be an atypical episode and that's why we love it because it's not set in the usual places mm. or the characters do something weird. Yep. And they, they've they done this so well here is that with Leslie and um, Bugger It, let's throw in Chris, with those two, they're acting against type and there's a hell of a lot of comedy to be had out of that mm -hmm. because they're acting weird and not like themselves. And then you go, what a ripping episode that we get to see them in this different state. And particularly with Chris, you see him in this vulnerable state. Mm. And um, But you get to have that. But you also, with the Ron and Andy storyline, they're not just being typical themselves. They're being hyper-typical because they're mm. both egging each other on. Yep. So you're getting what you expect from them normally, but you're getting it to the nth degree. So they're they're getting everything in this mm. episode. So it's um yeah I like the way they've done that. Whereas if you, your normal atypical episodes is you'll take the whole team right. Like I believe they went to London at some point. This yep. crew, and that would what you and me would just say. Oh yeah, well that's an atypical episode, and you get comedy out of them being themselves, but in a new environment and it's fresh territory and all that sort of stuff. This isn't that. Uh, I think this is possibly better than that. But again, I haven't seen it, so I wouldn't know. Anyway, those are my thoughts on that sort of thing. Mm. And I also feel like we get a minimum of uh, what I've called annoying dickheads, uh, like Tom and April, who are characters I just wouldn't like. But I mean, it's clear that you like them, and I know a lot of other people love those characters, and they say these are the breakout characters of the show. Mm. Like Andy's a breakout character, and you go, ah, yes, excellent. So I'm just going to take it on good faith that um, those characters are awesome, and it's just going to take me time to get used to them, you know. Yep, you warm up to them. They're like Jake, who I hated. <laughs> and now I go, oh, With it's a Jake. I love Jake. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll launch into some of my notes. Cool. I think this episode's got the best bits of Parks and Recreation. We've got Positivity. Leslie and Ben and Andy are all very positive characters and I think I've talked about this a bit recently on the podcast is some of the sitcoms we love are very dark and sarcastic and all that sort of stuff but this is very much leaning the other way, Parks and Rec. So I really like that. It's This episode's got a bit of romance but it's not cheesy or over the top with it. There's great gags, some scripted and some improvised and we've talked about many of those. And then the script, it's a really good script. They've figured out how to make great use of Anne. She's really at the centre of so much action in this episode um, because they set it in the hospital, so I thought that was really good. There's these two main plot threads, the flu and the meeting, and I think they brought those together really well and that forced Leslie and Ben into this situation where they had to trust and help each other. They got lots of value from that. And like you were saying, it put Ron and Andy together, which was just such an excellent combination. Um, I don't know how many of the clips we pulled were yeah. from that pair. <laughs> uh, um, there was good foreshadowing, and there was the example I gave of Chris's poor running form. There were some nice callbacks within the episode, like JJ's waffles being brought to the hospital for her, their favourite customer. <sighs> and then they um, tied everything up by resolving Andy's issues and April's, well, Andy and April's issues. Um, so they've kind of almost closed out that little storyline of them having this obstacle in their way. Mm. And they've added Ben and Chris to the show properly and put them on the same side as the the other characters. So I feel like this is almost a point where the show restarts mm. in a way. So to bring us back around to the beginning, mm. you would totally agree with the theory that, you know, Entertain the Elk put forward that this is where yep. the show was born. I'd say so. So is it, for a newbie like me, a good time to come in, or do you still need a bit of context and you'd recommend people watch, pick it up from maybe from the beginning of Series 2? Uh, I'd say maybe go back to the the episode, what is it, somewhere towards the end of it, Series 2, where they actually come in into the action. Ah, Chris and... Ben. Yep, because then you'll know who they are and it's in that last bit of season two where all the stuff is happening with Anne and then her kissing Andy, kissing Andy and all uh, that sort of stuff. So, ooh. yeah, that would um, be my recommendation. And I liked your point about having some of this on Anne's territory, so to speak, so she's got home court advantage. Mm. Um, 
to use a basketball parlance. And yes, I've got a, a loose note here about I do love the basketball references because Ben, of course, oh, yeah. saying that Leslie's flu performance there is like Jordan's famous flu game. And then in Leslie's office, you've got the Larry Bird signed photo there. And oh. He's from French Lick, Indiana and blah, blah, blah. So um, the basketball fans get a little bit of extra value stuff thrown their way, which mm. I thought was pretty cool. But um, yeah, yeah, that stuff yes. went, over, went, over, that went over my head. Ooh. And Larry Bird, Steve, and Michael Jordan, of course, are the Hall of Famiest Hall of Famers there are. Mm. So should we talk about the Hall of Fame? Well, go ahead. Yes. Um, all I'll, I was I'll going to it. say is <laughs> I thought this was good um, and not knowing enough about the show, and obviously if so many lists put this in the top five and, and you've proposed it, I mean, who am I to argue? I mean, clearly you're proposing this for the Hall of Fame. Do you reckon it's an absolute ripper shoe-in or do you reckon it's sort of a borderline case? I reckon it's a shoe in. There was only one joke that I didn't like. Yeah. But it was over in a over in a flash. Oh. The the and one just... I didn't like was, you know, they with Leslie's hallucinations and great gags, that had just gone really well, really well, really well. And at the very end they put in the posh font. I think I should drive you to the hospital. Was I wearing a tiara when I came in here? Because if you happen upon it, will you have Lady Penny face retrieve it and send it post hence? <laughs> I thought that was one too far <laughs> because she wasn't being herself. This mm. is clearly not something she'd say. Um, anyway, yeah. So That wasn't my one, but no, I can see oh, why okay. you'd put that one in. Yeah, yeah. And none of them had put a foot wrong up to that point, but, you know, it's a small mm. nitpick. No, my one was at the end of that first scene with um, Chris and Anne where she's talking about how he's perfect and she says, oh, I did think I heard him fart once, but... <laughs> No, that was me. Yeah. As if you wouldn't know that you'd let yeah. one rip. You would, yeah, yeah you'd, you'd absolutely know if you let one go. You would. Maybe she was so transfixed by his beauty she didn't realise that she'd blown off. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. it didn't make sense to me, but there you go. They can't all be winners, can they? No. <sighs> yeah, so apart from that one minor issue, I think the whole mm. thing is really, really super strong. No, cool. All right, well, I'll leave it to you then, Steve, to do your duty and update the spreadsheet, adding this one to the Hall of Fame. Oh, very good. Um, and before we go, we've had a suggestion yeah, uh, Nick, was it? that uh, we cover... Coach. coach right. Oh, coach. coach. Yes. But coach. we don't have Roku. Anyway, yes, um, yes. apologies to Nick who suggested this. It was Coach. Oh, I had forgotten, but it is Coach. Yep, 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 yep. So that's... um, And, of course, we've got a few in the queue, haven't we, Steve? That's not a cheers spin-off, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, this is something for us to discover, coach, perhaps. Coach died anyway after the first. Yeah. yeah. And then Woody, yeah, Woody Harrelson came, along. came in. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. Righto. Yes, cool. Right, okay. So anyway, um, but what I was trying to get towards is um, thank you for suggestions. Yes, thanks, um, Nick. Jolly good. And we, as I say, we've got a few there to choose from. Anyway, thank you, Steve, for bringing along Parks and Rec. I think it was probably well overdue. Oh, yeah. I wanted to get it in the first hundred episodes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I'm I'm well pleased, and um, I'm not going to tell anyone what I've selected for next time. Oh, it's top secret. It is top secret, but uh, it harkens back to something you previously selected, Steve. Oh. Yeah. A little bit of a hint. Yeah. Very good. Mm. Well, let's sign off, uh, listeners. We'll see you in a month or so. Cheers. Bye. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email sitcomshowdown at gmail.com.